Good morning, everyone. My name is Anya Prusa. I'm the Senior Associate and Slater Family Fellow at the Brazil Institute. Um, and we're really pleased to have you all joining us today. Um, this is an event um, on the path forward for Brazil-US relations. And we're very pleased to be doing this in partnership with um, GACINC, the Grupo de Análisis da Conjuntura Internacional at USP. And I just wanna turn this over really quick to Alberto Pfizer, who is uh, co-organizing this event with us. Um, Alberto, the floor is yours. Thank you, Anya. It's a great pleasure to be here today. Uh, it's a dream coming through. I want to thank Paulo Sotero for helping us putting this together. I want to thank my colleagues uh, from uh, Gacint, uh, particular those who are more devoted to this uh, task force on environmental issues. Uh, they are here joining us, Maria Herminia Tavares de Almeida, Eduardo Viola, Sueli Araújo, I also want to mention Jacques Markovic, who I think has not yet joined us, but, but is one of the champions of this initiative uh, at Gacinti. Gacinti is probably the most respected uh, group for the analysis of international affairs in the state of Sao Paulo. It is located at the Institute of International Relations at the University of Sao Paulo. Gacint has been uh, running for more than 20 years uh, with uh, meetings every three to four weeks. Most of the meetings are uh, closed to the general public, uh, Sharon House rules. But today we decided that the, due to the scope, the importance uh, of this particular subject, US-Brazil relations and the environmental agenda, the US under a new administration and the environmental issues gaining strength due to all the uh, aspects related to it, the meetings that we will have um, regarding uh, the, the, the international arrangements, the pandemic. Uh, we decided to have this as a more open session. We are very pleased that Nick Zimmerman has agreed to join us to share his thoughts or his uh, inspirations for us to discuss, to comment. And uh, the word will be open to all of you uh, that are here at, the, uh, at this room. Uh, people who are following us on Facebook will also be uh, able to ask questions. Um, I think those will be uh, written or by writing, right, Anya? And uh, will be directed to, to Nick or to us. Um, I just want to uh, have uh, Janina Onuki, uh, the director of the Institute of International Relations, who has found uh, some time in her uh, busy schedule to be here with us in this opening to uh, share a few words with us. Janina, please. Thank you. Thank you, Alberto. Thank you, Anya. Good morning. Uh, as the Dean of the International Relations Institute, I would like to welcome Dr. Nicholas Zimmerman. Dr. Zimmerman, it's an honor to have you here today. You will speak to a highly qualified audience at the Gacint from the University of São Paulo. Uh, I would also like to express my happiness in having the opportunity to organize this event in partnership with the Brazil Institute of the Woodrow Wilson Center. I strongly hope that we can have other joint initiatives in the near future. Uh, finally, I would like to thank Professor Paulo Sotero from Woodrow Wilson Center and Professor Alberto Pfeiffer from USP for this relevant initiative. Thank you very much. Thank you, Janina. So Paulo, I think uh, uh, it's, it's your time now. Uh, if you can do the introductions and uh, set up the the issues for Nick, jump in. Turn on your mic, Paulo. There. Uh, good morning, uh, Alberto. Good morning to all of you. It's a great pleasure to be here as a member of Gacint for many years. It's a, particularly, a particular pleasure to have been able to facilitate 
uh, this uh, partnership that we have now uh, between the Wilson Center's Brazil Institute and Gacinti. Uh, this was obviously very much uh, a, a work uh, brought to us by Maria Erminia, by Professor Viola, by you, Alberto. And it's a really a, a good <clears throat> type of collaboration that we look, look forward to, to, to develop, starting with this issue. Nick Zimmerman our uh, speaker of this inaugural event uh, is first of all, uh, a very dear friend. Uh, and he is uh, uh, the foremost expert, I would say today uh, uh, in the, the policy space that is not in the government. Uh, Nick Zimmerman is the guy to go to when it comes to Brazil-US relations, and I explained why. He has been uh, one of the most consistent participants in this space from the perspective of uh, both government, he was a US official, uh, he, he was also, he worked in the private sector, uh, and uh, he is now at Columbia University uh, where he has joined the World Projects. It is a uh, initiative by the Columbia University president uh, to uh, mobilize Columbia's researchers and scholars uh, to work with governments, organizations, businesses, uh, and communities uh, to tackle global challenges. So this is this, his current job. Uh, he is, as I mentioned, he was with the private sector before working uh, with uh, macro uh, advisory partners uh, where he, uh, I think, uh, worked with people that are now in the US government, like Jack Sullivan, uh, the new uh, head of the National Security Council in the Biden White House. Uh, he has had various positions, both in the White House as a member of the group advising uh, President Obama uh, during his uh, presidency on Brazil relations. Uh, he was also uh, uh, instrumental. He was an advisor to the UN, United Nations, uh, US ambassador to the United Nations on uh, uh, issues related to Brazil, global issues, etc. Uh, 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 Nick, as I call him, uh, uh, publishes, uh, has published widely in media uh, in the United States, in Europe, international, in, in Brazil. Uh, he is uh, a graduate from the Brown University uh, in, uh, in Rhode Island. And he has a, a master's of arts from Harvard Kennedy School uh, of Government. He, he also studied at the Federal Universities of Rio and the University of, uh, uh, the, the University of Chile, the, 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 the the Pontifical, the Catholic Pontifical University in, in Santiago. Uh, just briefly, four points that I would like to highlight uh, uh, he, about Nick. Uh, he was, as he is, he had a key role uh, on Brazil, working at the White House, the Obama White House, and the National Security Council staff. Uh, and in that capacity, uh, Nick uh, briefed and traveled with both President Obama and then Vice President uh, Biden to several bilateral engagements with then uh, President Dilma Rousseff, including uh, to Brasilia, Panama City, and here in Washington, D.C. Uh, he did so in collaborating uh, with uh, much of the national security team that has assumed leadership roles now 
uh, in the Biden White House. Uh, these efforts culminated uh, in President Rousseff's 2015 visit to the White House, uh, which not only allowed the two countries to turn the page on an unfortunate and tense chapter in the history of the bilateral relations, but also resulted in the most ambitious uh, pledge of bilateral cooperation on a global challenge, climate change, uh, uh, between the two countries in recent memory. This is very important. I would say uh, Nick was the architect of the most consequential engagement in recent times between Brazil and the United States. It has to do with an issue where Brazil and the United States are absolute key participants, climate change. It is the issue right now where Secretary of, uh, the former Secretary of State, uh, uh, John Kerry, now the special envoy for climate, uh, has already engaging, is already engaging with Brazilian authorities. And so uh, Nick has uh, a major uh, credit there goes to Nick because he prepared uh, the way. Uh, he is uh, uh, therefore, uh, uh, you know, he is familiar uh, with uh, current uh, U.S. policy issues. He is very familiar with uh, Brazilian uh, issues, focus or lack of focus on climate change in the case of Brazil. Uh, I think it he is the ideal interlocutor, especially to this Gassint group that focus on climate, on environment. And uh, 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 with that, I would like to invite my dear friend, Nick Zimmerman to offer his thoughts uh, and start us off in this presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning to, to all. Greetings from New York. Uh, bom dia a todos. Um, Anya, uh, Alberto, uh, Janina, Paulo, thank you for the for the opportunity to to be with you all here to today. Uh, it's really an honor, uh, especially on such a timely and important topic. It is also a rather daunting challenge, as I'm cognizant of the incredible number of of experts that Gasinj and the Brazil Institute. Have, have gathered here today. Uh, and so I very much hope that we can have as open a discussion uh, as possible to take advantage of all of the expertise here in the quote unquote room, as close as we can get these days and in, in, in these pandemic times and, and, and really hear a, a variety of, of different perspectives on what's undeniably uh, a rather complex series of, of issues. As Paulo uh, alluded to in his very kind introduction, Paulo, thank you. Um, I spent much of the Obama administration working on the US-Brazil relationship. And I did so alongside many of the most relevant US foreign policy leaders now serving in the Biden-Harris administration, including, as, as Paulo mentioned, during President uh, Rousseff's uh, June 2015, uh, visit to the White House that resulted in a historic series of joint commitments on climate change in the run-up to the, to the Paris Accords. And so uh, for those reasons, when, when Paolo and, and, and Alberto and, and, and Anya approached me uh, about the possibility of, of, of setting up a dialogue such as, such as this, and I reflected, especially over this weekend, um, how to frame my remarks uh, for today on the bilateral relationship moving forward. I thought it would be prudent actually to start by looking back at that, at that period uh, uh, a bit, um, just to contextualize and, and ground the conversation. Um, so when I arrived at the National Security Council at the, the foreign policy arm of the, of the White House in, in early 2014, um, as everyone uh, here knows, Washington and, and Brasilia were barely on speaking terms. Uh, the situation was tense. And really my marching orders from, from my leadership uh, were to fix things uh, and again, normalize the, the diplomatic relationship. 
no small order. Um, and this would not have been possible without then Vice President Biden's leadership and commitment. In collaboration with Jake Sullivan, who at the time was Biden's national security advisor in his capacity as vice president, but is now the national security advisor of the United States. Uh, and Juan Gonzalez, who at the time was Biden's senior advisor for Latin American affairs and is now the National Security Council head of Western Hemisphere Affairs. My boss, known I'm sure to many, uh, Ricardo Zuniga, uh, who was the NSC Senior Director for Western Hemisphere Affairs at that time, and now actually uh, is the Interim Director at the Brazil Institute. Uh, we all supported together Vice President Biden's shuttle diplomacy with Rousseff um, as we sought to get the relationship back on track. Uh, as Paulo mentioned, in fact, Jake, Juan, and I uh, actually traveled with President Biden to Brazil to the 2014 World Cup in Brazil to meet with Rousseff uh, in, in, to further this effort. Um, and we all staffed really quite a number of phone calls uh, between the two leaders as we tried to get the relationship into a better place. At the same time, Ricardo and I, just in our auspices at the National Security Council, maintained a really robust series of what we call in Washington interagency meetings, interministerial meetings, where we bring all of the various ministries and departments together to think through policy processes. And we kept doing this on Brazil specifically so that we would be prepared to have a substantive real policy agenda should a visit between President Obama and President Rousseff ever be confirmed ever firm up. Um, sometimes these things land on the calendar relatively quickly. You don't want to be caught as the staffer uh, surprised and not willing to or not equipped to deliver the goods, so to speak. So we continued internally to the United States, a very rigorous process to think through what our priorities and the relationships would be, even when US-Brazil relations at the head of state level were not at their, were not at their best. Um, ultimately, President Obama and President Rousseff met in Panama City in April of 2015 uh, on the margins of the 2015 Summit of the Americas, which was uh, famous really uh, because of the first face-to-face -face meeting between President Obama and Raul Castro. Um, but we actually took care of quite a lot of business during that summit, one of which was to set a date proper for President Rousseff to come to Washington and to turn the page and move forward uh, in the relationship. A decision was made to schedule that meeting for, for June. So in fact, Ricardo and I's precautions in preparing this whole time uh, were not in vain as we quickly pivoted to preparing a highly consequential bilateral engagement between two heads of state with relatively short notice. We were talking about roughly two months of, of preparation. At that time, we were entering the, not the end, excuse me for the uh, noise there, uh, not the end, but we were entering the, the latter phases of the Obama presidency. And there was a real desire from way up top from the boss himself to use his time, I think we can all appreciate uh, in this environment that the principle that the head of state's time is perhaps the most precious resource available to us to advance diplomacy, um, to really use his time to deliver ambitious and transformational outcomes. By the time we got to year five or year six of the Obama presidency, small wins, small gains were not necessarily considered to be a good use of the president's time. And I think part of that guidance in a Western hemisphere, Brazil specific way was motivated by an ongoing sense <clears throat> that the US-Brazil relationship had yet really to scratch the surface of the relationship's potential. That throughout the years, and Paolo and others can speak to the history even, even better than, than, than I, but 
whether it was more because of a Brazilian perspective or a US perspective, somehow in one way or another, we just kept talking past each other. And that in 2015, the Obama administration really needed, wanted <clears throat> to use this visit to raise the level of ambition of what the two countries could accomplish together. And in so doing, develop a blueprint for how the relationship should evolve moving forward past the Obama era and past the Rousseff era, but really create a template, a floor of ambition for where, frankly, two of the largest countries and two of the largest democracies really should be collaborating. This should not be small potatoes, so to speak. We're talking about two serious players in, in the world. Um, and we wanted to point the way forward for how that level of ambition could continue even beyond the specifics of what we were trying to design in 2015. And so with that context and with the date set, Ricardo and myself and others, we really began to survey what were President Obama's remaining top priorities in that final quarter um, of his time in office. And then consider them in the context of US-Brazil dynamics, and Brazilian interests. And, and in so doing, it became clear, particularly to, to me, um, that cooperation on countering climate change was the best issue to try to elevate. So from an American perspective, getting the Paris Climate Agreement over the finishing line in 2015 was a top priority for Obama. And part of the US strategy for ensuring its success was using bilateral presidential meetings to lock in joint commitments on the climate front um, with the major countries, with the major players. Um, the idea was to build momentum or, or, or build almost a sense of inevitability to the international community writ large that disagreement is going to happen. Um, and so we had already done this with countries such as China and India and so it made perfect sense to try with Brazil, notwithstanding, or if I'm being honest, perhaps precisely because of some of the differences in opinion that Washington and Brasilia had brought to bear in past climate debates. And there was just no question that Brazil had a very important role uh, to play here. I mean, its relevance on climate questions is unquestionable. And it's not just because of the Amazon, right? I mean, I don't need to tell this group that. It's been a diplomatic leader in the space, right? Since at least the early 1990s with its sponsorship of the Rio summit. Um, it had a relatively good track record at that time um, as a leader, right? As deforestation and several other metrics at that time had been heading in the right direction more often than not uh, in years preceding the visit. If I'm not mistaken, uh, Brazil, I'm talking in 2015, but Brazil had reduced its greenhouse gas emissions by about 41% compared to 2005 at that time. And more generally, Brazil was a leader in the global south with a very able diplomat, diplomatic corps coming out of Itamarachi and someone that we felt could be an important ally, not only in finalizing Paris, but then in implementing it moving forward, right? And with each every five-year interval of the agreement becoming theoretically anyway more and more ambitious, having Brazilian diplomats in lockstep with us on that um, struck us as also something that would be crucial to the agreement's uh, success. So in other words, as we were assessing at the time from both the US and a Brazilian perspective, we thought that by working together on climate change and elevating that in the context of this presidential visit, we could show leadership together, the US and Brazil standing side by side on one of the world's most pressing problems. And that that was a window into what the US-Brazil relationship should always involve, which is global cooperation, right? It should not just be US-Brazil. It should not just be US-Brazil talking about the rest of Latin America. Everything should be on the table. And this struck us as the definitive way to do that. And as such, it struck us as a clear win-win for both countries. And again, sort of a template for the future of where we wanted the relationship to go. 
my sense, I, I, I can't speak for them, but um, President Rousseff's team, I think, perceived a similar opportunity. And we were ultimately able to agree, as Paolo alluded, to really a historic joint statement on climate change cooperation. Um, it's still out there online if people wanna, wanna look at it, but I thought I would just flag a couple of the highlights of what those commitments were, um, again, just for context and to ground the, the conversation. Perhaps first and foremost, there was a joint commitment for each country to increase their share of renewables beyond hydropower um, in their respective electricity matrices by 20% by 2030. This would have required the United States to triple its share of renewable energy between 2015 and 2030. And it would have required Brazil to double uh, its share. Brazil, uh, and this was a unilateral decision that they made in the negotiation, decided to pledge in this joint statement to restore and reforest 12 million hectares of forests by 2030. Um, and we also agreed to work multilaterally, whether at the UN, the G20, um, and in the Montreal Protocol specifically, to work to phase down the use of hydrofluorocarbons, HFCs, which are typically used in sort of refrigeration devices, whether refrigerators or air conditioners, but are extremely harmful greenhouse gas emissions. So we pledged to work together on that. Um, and we also created a brand new working group that was aimed at enhancing bilateral cooperation on, a, on an array of issues, but including perhaps most relevant for today, uh, land use, clean energy, and adaptation. Um, and among the other areas of focus within this working group more generally, the, the joint statement envisioned a binational program on forest and land sector investment. The idea being, let's work together to figure out how to improve conditions for attracting investment in sustainable forest management and forest restoration. So I'll just, as a tangent, when the current Brazilian government talks about the need for additional investments in a vacuum at a high level, that's a bipartisan issue in Washington. That was something that you heard the Trump administration respond to positively, but it was also envisioned in 2015 under the Obama government um, as well, as I, just, as I just highlighted. Of course, the devil is in the details, but as a principle, investment in creating more sustainable ways to develop forest regions, the Amazon, Pantanal, whatever it might be, um, Democrats were open to that too, right? Um, also, we've talked about private sector investment quite a bit over the last couple of years. The 2015 joint statement envisioned a convening of a public sector, private sector forum on innovative forest investment um, and, and, and creating an expert group of government agencies and private sector interlocutors to think about how to improve conditions for forest investment in, 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 in both countries. And then finally, the idea too was as two leaders in the climate space, whatever type of innovation and cooperation we develop together might have applicability in other regions in, in need. And so if you refer back to that statement, we talk about potentially bringing our expertise to bear in cooperation in the Congo Basin in Africa, the Amazon basin writ large, again, I, I know I don't need to tell this group, right? But so many equate the Amazon only with Brazil. And yet there are many Amazonian countries and perhaps our expertise together could help some of those countries. And then finally in the Caribbean as well. Um, again, very much in the spirit of US Brazil leading together globally in, in this space. Now, and I know I don't need to tell this group that we are, we are obviously in a much different political moment. But I raise all of this and, and I spend some time on the history uh, because again, the current US National Security Advisor for Biden, the current Director of the National Economic Council, Brian Deese, and the new NSC Senior Director for Western Hemisphere Affair, Juan Gonzalez, they were all involved in these negotiations that I'm referring at one stage or another. 
So in other words, I think what I'm saying here is the famous expression that, you know, Brazil is not a country for beginners. I love, I always use this in my, in my talks, but you know, the good news is that the new US team, it's not composed of beginners when it comes to Brazil. They know what the bilateral relationship can deliver, but, but climate change as an issue has been at the forefront of much of their US Brazil government experience. And this should not be underestimated moving forward, particularly now that the Democratic Party as a whole has evolved on the issue even further. And it is now a core foreign policy priority writ large, not just in a Brazil specific way, but across the board. It's an orienting principle of the Democratic Party and Biden's foreign policy. So what does this mean <laughs> in terms of the US posture now uh, moving forward? <clears throat> well, a lot was made uh, per particularly in, in Brazilian media about uh, President Biden's uh, comment about sanctions during the, the presidential debates during the, during the campaign. You know, of course, we were in peak political season here in the United States at that moment in time. And I think what that comment reflected, at least in part, if not more than in part, uh, was the growing perception, which still exists, in Washington, that uh, President Bolsonaro had not pursued a partnership with the United States, but had rather pursued an alliance with former President Trump and perhaps the Republican Party. So in other words, it was good election politics. I don't mean to undermine the, the, the weight of the statement, but it was good politics. And I do think though, there was an initial inclination in the circle uh, maybe to be a bit more combative during the election um, when it came to Brazil. And you know, now as the Biden team settles in a bit and the team starts to get formed, right? It's still very early. Um, I now sense that this has changed somewhat. And the posture in the United States, it's, it's evolving. Um, it's evolving more to taking a, a wait and see approach. In other words, let's engage. And let's, let's not prejudge. Let's see what discussions could deliver. So this is not to say that there is a lot of trust in the relationship at this, at this moment. There is not, there isn't. There, there's, a, there's a decided, I think, trust deficit. Um, but the United States, we talk to countries with which we don't align on values and policy all the time. Um, with countries with whom our values and policy diverge more so than, than even with the Bolsonaro government. Um, and frankly, we do need dialogue and cooperation with Brazil on a range of issues, particularly climate and COVID, given everything that's going on, but on many other issues too. I mean, you name it, democracy in the world, China, Venezuela, the agenda is always robust. Not talking is just, it's not a good option for anyone involved. And this is a serious team on the US side. They're really experienced and they are going to put forward a good faith effort to work with the Brazilians to find a compromise, including on the financing side, which is why I wanted to highlight that some of that was envisioned back in 2015. Now, I'm not sure it's gonna meet the expectations that, that Minister Salias has been putting out there in Brazilian media, but um, the interest really is there. I should also add that, again, from a US perspective, engaging in good faith has the added benefit also of helping Washington sidestep or avoid in some measure, elements anyway, of the traditional sensitivities in Brazil surrounding the, the Amazon, the so-called uh, sovereignty trap that frankly Bolsonaro seemed to put to good political use in his, in his back and forth with, for example, a French president Macron uh, a few years ago. By engaging and showing good faith, uh, talking to Brazilian interlocutors in the government, perhaps in civil society, it's not so easy to just say that the United States is mandating from above, and this is a new form of you know, environmental colonialism, as we saw, I think, um, in the back and forth between Bolsonaro and, and, and Macron and, and, 
and Europe uh, writ large. And so that tactically, I think also um, putting forward a good effort, engaging in good faith uh, is smart. But we should make no mistake here. Uh, the devil is really going to be in the details. So I, I have noted that most of the recent reporting about the emerging climate discussions between the two governments, uh, it's almost exclusively coming from the Brazilian media right now. You don't see a lot of coverage on it here in the United States. And I think that's because the politics around these discussions in the two countries is fundamentally different. Um, so from Brazil's perspective, from Bolsonaro's perspective, the mere fact that these conversations are happening are a sign, or they hope it's a sign, they hope to at least message that it's a sign, that its foreign policy approach is working and that the country has not become more of an international, for lack of a better word, pariah, now that Biden has been elected. So they have a clear interest in highlighting that these discussions are ongoing. But John Kerry's team has been quieter and is really, I think, going to remain just hyper-focused on the nuts and bolts of the negotiations. So unless there's real substantive progress in these conversations, Washington has little incentive to make this into a big deal. Bolsonaro is controversial at home. There is a rather large segment of the Democratic Party that that has really been alienated by, by his comments, whether on social issues, whether on the US election, um, and to include comments made by, by some of his most trusted advisors and, and family. And so if there isn't a real substantive accomplishment to highlight, I don't think you're gonna see the US side you know, trumpeting uh, these conversations. My understanding is that the technical convert consultations between the two sides, they are happening on an almost weekly basis. And the US side right now is really trying to prioritize scoping out, understanding what's real in terms of potential commitments and, and what's not. So in other words, rhetoric without action, it's not going to work from the US side. And Kerry's team is sufficiently knowledgeable, sufficiently experienced, and sufficiently networked with global civil society on climate change matters that they are going to understand if the Brazilian side is putting real skin in the game, so to speak, or not. They're not going to be hoodwinked. You're not going to be able to just say you're gonna do a bunch of things, not follow through uh, and have the, the, the US negotiating team uh, buy it. That's just not feasible. And in terms of timelines and calendar, the major benchmarks, I think from an American perspective, and just so everyone can sort of orient themselves throughout 2021, not that any of this will be that much of a surprise, but the major benchmarks, I think, for seeing more of a real substantive commitment from the Brazilian government will first be in the climate summit that Biden is preparing to host in April. And then, of course, at the next COP uh, in Glasgow in November, all of which is to say the American side is going to want to see real commitments from the Brazilian side this year, and more precisely, probably by April and certainly no later than November. Now, should the Biden administration ultimately deem that this engagement is inadequate, right, in terms of delivering results? I do, I do fear for the trajectory of the relationship overall. Um, so, you know, my sense is that after an initial period of goodwill that we've just been describing and engagement, if progress is meager, you will see a shift in Washington's approach at some point. And it will adopt more of a, of a, of a stick-like approach, you know, carrots and, and, and sticks. And, and so I can't say at this juncture exactly what that would look like, but broadly speaking, um, I think you'll see something that aligns closely with Europe's approach in terms of changes to supply chain policy. So 
uh, labeling certain products coming from Brazil, um, other regulations essentially requiring confirmation that Brazilian products are being produced in a sustainable way that isn't hurting um, the Amazon or other you know, vulnerable regions. And I should just say there is precedent for this within US legislation. So for example, there is a bill that's called the Lacey Act. Um, the Lacey Act is a law that actually was first passed in 1900. So it's an old law um, to ban trafficking in certain forms of wildlife. You might be wondering why is Nick talking about wildlife? Well, it's been amended several times over the years, uh, most recently in 2008 to include additional products. And the 2008 amendment in particular included plant products, so paper and logging. Um, and so as Lacey essentially creates a, a ban on trading these types of products if they're harvested irregularly. Um, there are also declaration requirements about the product's origin, how much of it was produced, how much it's worth. Uh, and, and so if things go awry, I think some Brazilian products as is could probably be targeted more aggressively under Lacey as Lacey is currently constituted. And then in other instances, I raise Lacey more in the context of it's the type of blueprint, it's the type of legislation out there that a Biden administration could maybe use to expand on whether through executive action or some other bill. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm speculating here a little bit just to give a little bit of the kind of menu of potential options out there if things sour. Um, you know, again, should negotiations not, not go well. And, you know, I think the thinking there would be if new, it, either you target through Lacey more aggressively Brazilian products or you develop new restrictions and regulations. And if you do that in coordination with Europe and you do that at the same time that the United States with its recommitment to Paris and climate change writ large, it's prioritizing financial offsets to the larger Amazon basin as a whole, potentially with those countries that are more willing to partner, for example, Colombia, um, or in other vulnerable regions in the global south outside of the Americas, that, that contrast becomes pretty stark, right? Brazil's uh, isolation is growing at the same time that more international funding is coming in, um, and it's causing more pain to the Brazilian economy because it's, it's it's doing it in conjunction with, with Europe. It's one thing to have tensions with the EU um, when you've got your closest ally in Washington being Donald Trump. It's another thing when you're facing similar pressure from Europe, the United States, US, uh, Brazil, China relations are complicated for other reasons. It's a slightly different scenario, all at the same time that you're actually seeing uh, industrialized nations uh, beginning to rethink and up their level of ambition of financial offsets, right? So I think that type of a scenario, the pressure on Plan Alto in that context is not insignificant. Now, would it be enough to change Bolsonaro's and Salis's approach and, and, and posture? Uh, you know, I don't know. And I think, frankly, that's a question better answered by our Brazilian friends uh, here today. But I guess I'll just conclude with what I'm really trying to get across here is that in, in most ways, the ball is much more in Brazil's court right now than the United States is. And so as such, I think, I think maybe I'll stop here and, and perhaps we can open the discussion to hear other points of view. Again, I just I want to thank everyone for for chiming in and, and, and thank the Brazil Institute and Best Seeds for, for the invitation. It's, it's really been quite, quite an honor and I look forward to digging in further. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nick. Quite optimistic, some clouds in the sky, but uh, I think we have some room for developing some positive dialogue here. And I thank you so much for arranging this both uh, history, recent history of the relationship with the, you know, the, the people who were the, the main operators of this, um, of, of recent events, and also laying out the perspectives for, for this new administration. 
Uh, I would like to have uh, Professor Jacques Markovic as, uh, as the initial commentator. Jacques, if you will. Thank you very much, my dear Alberto. Greetings to Paulo Sotero, to Janina, uh, to Maria Herminia, and to my colleagues uh, of Gassinti. And I want to congratulate you, Nick, for this uh, such uh, uh, inclusive presentation. And uh, you, you try to approach most of the topics. I would have dreamed to have this conversation on May 1st, after the 22nd April meeting because then we will know what really happened in the preparation of the meeting and the outcomes. So uh, I would leave this as a suggestion uh, to Paolo and to Alberto Pfeiffer if we could get together again uh, four weeks or six weeks from now and find out what happened in uh, the meeting. Uh, Senator Kerry was yesterday in Brussels and he presented and he made this very strong point about the importance of this meeting in the preparation of the Glasgow meeting by the end of the year. So having said that, the first uh, sensitivity that I would like to bring to your attention is the need to join what we did in the Rio 92 is environment and development. And it is very important when we talk about uh, environmental policy is to think about uh, the reduction of inequality, the whole issue of employment and income generation. Uh, I think that this is a problem for the US. It's a problem also for Brazil. So whatever we will be discussing in terms of the implementation of a climate policy, we have to think also about those dimensions. Having said that, I would like to remind us that when uh, Brazil approved uh, in the Brazilian Congress uh, the uh, national contribution, there was no mention of external resources. The diplomacy at that time understood that it was very important for Brazil to make sure that it can meet its commitment for 2030 with its own resources regarding the reduction of emission and also the uh, recovery the recovery of the forestry and the, the so-called uh, uh, to reduce to zero illegal uh, deforestation. So I think that we have a country, which is our country, that is committed as part of a state. The Brazilian state is committed. What you did mention very appropriately is that governments might have different views regarding how which are the priorities. And I think uh, we welcome very much what the US government is doing now. Uh, what you mentioned in your presentation, and maybe we would like to hear you a little bit more about the engagement of civil society, the academic community and uh, other social actors. How are you in the preparation of the 22nd of April meeting? How are you engaged those actors in the US? And how are you going to, in some way, uh, follow up on the engagement of those actors in Brazil? Because this is what will make whatever commitments, uh, those commitments will be implementable. And then I will conclude with one word that you did mention is metrics. I think any public policy depends on three things, leadership, strategy, and metrics. So if you could tell us from the US side, probably you will be better prepared to tell us which are the leaders, which is the strategy, which are the metrics. And then if you have an expectation from our side, obviously there is a simple question regarding the national contribution for the Paris Accord for 2030. But how to make sure that this is going to be the frame of discussion and how would you tell us that the US will prepare itself engaging especially science in this discussion. These are my few comments, congratulating you, Nick. When Paolo introduced your CV, I thought that I will see a, a, a 60, 70 years old man. And uh, what I see, it's almost a youngster uh, bring, taking the floor. So I wish you a, a long, a long professional career and uh, keep up with our country because I'm sure that we will have better days in the future. Thank you. Very good, Jack. Very good, Jacques. I think your compliment made the day for Nick. And uh, okay, uh, Nick, do you want to react? We have four people uh, waiting to uh, 
make some uh, comments? Uh, should sure, we go but, right one by one? Uh, Sure. Yeah. Let's, as time permits, why, why, why not? Jacques, thank you for the, for the kind words and uh, 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 the, the very important questions. Uh, I'll just say uh, uh, I'm older than I look. It's, it's these residual baby cheeks, uh, but, but thank you. Um, I was a bit of a baby when they, when they threw me to the wolves at the, at the White House, uh, but I appreciate it. You know, with respect to civil society, I couldn't agree with you more. I think it's critical, um, which is why more generally, I'm, I'm just so pleased to see, this is not addressing your question directly, but um, I'm just so pleased to see opportunities for dialogues like this, right? Between a world leading think tank in Washington, the Brazil Institute, and such a renowned group and center within such a renowned university uh, with, with, with Gacinch. And the Brazil Institute, I think has a really important um, translator role almost to play here. You know, they've also developed a, a technical partnership with the Concertação da, da, das Amazonas. And I think all of that, we need more of that, not, not less. I do think that, um, I do think that the U.S. government needs to hear as many voices and Brazilian authorities in this space as, as possible. And, and frankly, Jacques, I, I, I want to recognize it's a bit of a challenge because despite the fact that the US team does have a lot of Brazil experience in 2014, 2015, we were negotiating with the Brazilian government because we had a Brazilian government that was clearly interested and engaged. You know, there was a fabulous environment minister, Isabella Teixeira, I'm sure she's known to, to many of you. I, there, didn't, there wasn't a perception that we needed to go outside of the government. And so I, I just wanna be honest with you. I think that this is, this is something a little bit newer. And I hope that the new negotiating team adapts accordingly. Um, and my hope is that if not Kerry's team, I'm not presuming anything one way or the other, but some of the Latin America policy officials in the Biden team, um, like a Juan Gonzalez, um, are very familiar with the Brazil Institute. And I, for example, and I just, I hope that they're you know, reaching out to Anya and Paolo to ensure that those per perspectives are being surfaced. There are also smaller things that can be done. Um, I noticed that some of my mentors in government, people like uh, Samantha Power, who's soon to be hopefully uh, the new head of our, our international development agency, um, and who was my boss at the United Nations, she always made a point whenever she traveled to a country for a foreign engagement, she always had time left to engage with local civil society. Uh, and I've seen that with a number of other leaders. My hope is that the Kerry team is just doing that as a matter of principle. And I do understand that as they approach countries, their networks, because they're such experienced climate policy makers, their networks are civil society accessible. But I don't, Jacques, have like specific detail on what those conversations are because I'm not in government anymore, right? And there's only so much, uh, you know, they, they, they tell me. But I think I just want to assure you that people such as myself think it's critically important, as do renowned institutions in the Washington DC matrix, like the Wilson Center, like the Brazil Institute, which is for those very reasons trying to bring uh, uh, people such as ourselves, these communities together. With respect to metrics, I also couldn't agree with you more. I just, I don't think we're quite there yet, right? I mean, let's be, let's be real. The Biden administration has been in office for less than two months. They've had one or two high level, like Kerry and Blinken level engagements, and the technical staffs are now, are now talking. So I take your point. And when I talk about accountability and the US side wanting to see real commitment, that dialogue for dialogue's sake will be insufficient, I'm talking about metrics. And I'm talking about metrics, I think, in the context of April and November. But we are in March, and I don't have enough information to get ahead of the negotiating teams. But, but, but just to assure, I agree with you on, on, on both. Thank you. Very good. So, uh, as I Thank said, you. we have four, four people. Uh, we have uh, Eduardo Viola, one of the foremost experts on 
environmental issues and foreign issues in Brazil, uh, former professor of University of Brazil and now with USP. Then we have Sueli Araujo, former president of the Brazilian Institute of the Environment, that translate this way. And then Maria Herminia Tavares de Almeida, uh, full professor of political science uh, from USP. And then Eduardo Masson, um, entrepreneur and the champion of uh, green financing. Okay, so Viola, please. Okay, thank you very much, Alberto. Thank you very much, Nick. Excellent presentation. I learned a lot of detailed things about your the negotiations in 2015. Uh, let me put raise four points. The first one is related to this negotiation. I think it were the, the performance of the Obama administration was remarkable in changing uh, the path of the Brazilian uh, undertaken in relation to Paris. Uh, I was uh, following, I'm somehow involved from civil society in the discussions about the Brazilian national determined contribution in 2015. And the dynamic was not good at all until the summit uh, and the negotiations. And this was remarkable. Though uh, the question is that at that time, the, the importance of the Brazilian climate change issue was declining in Brazilian public opinion and in Brazilian government. Yeah? For example, in 2012, a major transform change was related to the way it was approved uh, the reform of the forest code yeah? with amnesty for uh, the forest, the previous deforested, the what is a bad, bad recipe. We know about this. And the other thing was that we were in 2015 already full in economic crisis. And because of that reduction in the budget of uh, the Ministry of the Environment and increase in deforestation. 2015, we, have, we had 50, uh, 30 percent increase in deforestation. It was a major turning point that continues until today, as you know very well. Second point, in relation to the climate summit in, uh, in, in April. Uh, um, I think because the severity of the Brazilian situation in the pandemic, okay, and the fact that there is a global scarcity of vaccines in the world, and the process of vaccination of Brazilian population is, is very, very slow, uh, the Brazilian public agenda in the next months will be completely captured by the pandemic, okay? Uh, and so uh, my, here there is an opportunity and I would like to ask you, and maybe it's, uh, you are not in the government, but maybe, maybe you know much more. One thing that would be key for increasing the relationship between Brazil and the United States and uh, the public opinion in Brazil about the United States and the Biden administration would be to offer a supply of extra vaccines because right now United, the United States corporation, Moderna, Pfizer and, and Janssen are the best in the world in the production of vaccines and the production has increased dramatically the vaccination also. So it's a major shift compared with Two, two months ago, the Trump administration. Uh, the problem, uh, I mean, that we are now in a situation that is becoming worse than United States in January. And, uh, and really, all the experts are saying that, okay, in terms of, so I think this is would be something very relevant from the American point of view. I think uh, possible because Brazil, the United States in the following mes months will reach the, uh, sup the supply of, of vaccines that uh, um, enough for uh, vaccination of the whole population in the United States. So I would think, I mean, at the time of the, of the uh, air summit in April, I think the best 
connection between the, uh, um, the, uh, the Biden administration and Brazil would be on uh, offering of vaccination and maybe other supplies, uh, medical supplies related to the, to the pandemic. Third point, in relation to the, uh, the engagement of the civil society, I think I completely agree that this key, yeah, with you and, and Jack, okay? But uh, there is a, something that you didn't talk about, but I think is crucial in relation to climate change. That is the engagement with subnational governments, particularly state governments, uh, not only in the Amazon, but in the whole country, because there is a coalition of governors, most of the governors, even some of them that are more uh, supporters of Bolsonaro, they are re they are interested in in, in increasing their uh, uh, climate policies. Let's say, okay, this varies, it's heterogeneous a lot, but so I think this is a would be a very interesting way of engaging Brazil, combine it with civil society. To be, to be honest, I am a skeptical, uh, not completely, but a skeptical about the possibility of changing in the Bolsonaro administration, okay? The Bolsonaro administration uh, is more and more going in a populist uh, uh, dynamic, okay? And in which the global transnational forces of Brazil, Okay, that the branches of multinational corporations, the big Brazilian corporations, finance, the, the modern sector of the agribusiness, will likely decline their uh, influence in the Bolsonaro administration. Uh, uh, even in the, at the time that the influence was significant in the last two years, let's say, I mean, there was no capability of changing the the, the path of the Bolsonaro administration in relation to the environment and climate. And um, the fourth and last point, point is the following. Uh, do, you, you, you talk about the shift in Washington policy after a wait and see period. And the shift is there is no uh, appropriate, at least some good uh, response from the Bolsonaro administration. Uh, my, my question is the following. There is here a tension between two goals of the Bolsonaro administration and of the Biden administration in relation to Brazil. One is related to climate, environment, and so on. That is a priority, no doubt. But there is another priority of the Biden administration that is to keep Brazil in the gravitational field uh, uh, as allied of United States. Uh, and blocking the possibility of being attracted by China. China is very, very eager to attract Brazil. And even if Bolsonaro is anti-China, but you know that the dynamic of international relations is not just based, based in, in the idea of a president. The question is that if you have a, a, a increased pressure from the Biden administration or on the Bolsonaro administration, you, you can produce an approximation between Brazil and China, okay? That is something that is very bad for the objectives of the, of the geopolitical objectives in Latin America of the Biden administration. So I would like to know what you to comment about this tension, okay? Thank you very much. Thank you, Eduardo. There was a, a wide ranging uh, series of comments and, and, and questions I, um, I appreciate it. Uh, you know, I think maybe I'll, I'll start with where you you ended. Um, I do think that there is a concern in Washington, a growing concern, um, and it's increasingly a bipartisan one, not just a Republican or Democratic issue, uh, with China and its and its role uh, in in the world. I think that's I think that's undeniable. Um, the hardening of opinion is not just a Republican phenomenon. Uh, you know, in the party, there had always, in the Democratic Party, there had always been China hawks. For example, Chuck Schumer, the Senator from New York, who's actually this, the Senate Majority Leader. So he 
He runs the Democratic Senate caucus. He's always been a China hawk, right? But not everyone felt that way. And we've seen a shift over, over, the, over the years. I do think that China, at least on the margins, Eduardo, its kind of looming role is one of the reasons why, I mean, I'm speculating, but it's one of the reasons why the Biden team, at least in the beginning, uh, is trying to engage with Brazil in good faith, is trying to engage with Bolsonaro in good faith. It recognizes there's a tension and it's trying to lower the temperature and get to some sort of compromise to figure out what can we do um, to better protect the Amazon, to increase climate change in a way that works for Bolsonaro's politics and, and do so in a way that doesn't totally you know, alienate them. With that said, um, the Biden administration does not see the China question in a Cold War prism. So it's not going to just sacrifice climate change because it might push Brazil in, in, in China's direction. And the Biden team does not see Brazil as being in the United States orbit as a satellite nation. I mean, that's really more 1970s, 80s thinking. The, the Biden team is coming at this again from a 2014, 2015 perspective where we were trying to break out of all of that and actually lead with Brazil on a global issue because we think it has the potential to be one of the most important players in geopolitic, geopolitics throughout the 21st century. So I only raise that, I'm not trying to debate with you, it's just the orientation, it's, it's, it's not quite that. So first, they're not coming, you're either with us or against us. You saw that with the Trump administration, right? And it would, it would manifest itself over you know, Huawei. You either go with a non-Chinese company um, or, or, and you're with us, or you go against, um, or, or you go, uh, you go with Huawei, and then and then you're against us. It's like a litmus test foreign policy. I just think it's going to be more nuanced uh, with with Biden. So, giving a five G contract away isn't necessarily the end of a relationship, but they'll want to see other commitments, whether it's in climate change, on human rights, maybe at the UN. There's a bit more wiggle room there, and. I guess the final point that I would just make is it's unclear to me, I'd be curious what you and others think, it's unclear to me that even if the US-Brazil relationship goes badly because of climate change, it's not clear to me that that means that Bolsonaro jumps into bed, so to speak, with the Chinese. Uh, you know, He seems to think that being anti-China um, is good for his own politics at home. And, and he's taken some of the teeth out of these policies anyway, right? I mean, he talked a lot about reducing Brazil-China trade relations, and we haven't seen any of that, really. I mean, China remains, you know, the number one trade partner out of necessity. Um, so it's unclear to me even how uh, exactly Bolsonaro would react and what that would really mean in practical terms when throughout this entire period, China has remained the country's most important uh, trade partner. Um, I'm sorry, Eduardo, what, you, you had one other question as well. It was on, um, my, I can't hear you. It was about the sub, uh, ah, the sub, the sub, the sub right. and so, about the pandemic and the vaccines. Yeah. Per, yeah, thank you. Thank you for reminding me. So on, on, on sub-national uh, outreach, I think it's a great idea. Um, again, it's a little bit of less explored territory because this team was more accustomed to working at the federal level. Um, the one question that I have in mind um, for you and others uh, in, in Brazil is I've heard mixed things about how much potential is there in part because um, so much of state budgets depends on the federal government, that a lot of these leaders might be scared or hesitant to engage with the United States on climate change matters for fears of angering the executive. And the way that the United States typically does development, they don't just 
come in and, and do an infrastructure project, right? Like the Chinese, like here's 50 million, buy a dam. It's more capacity building, right? Scale, like starting a pilot initiative and scaling up. So, I, you know, I don't have a full understanding of the politics on the ground in Brazil, but, but some Brazilian colleagues of mine are skeptical on the potential of subnational outreach. I don't think that means that we shouldn't try, but I wonder about how ambitious that could uh, uh, become. Um, and then on the vaccines, I think it's a, it's a, it's a great point. Um, it certainly makes sense. You know, what I would say is I have, I have a hard time envisioning the Biden administration linking climate change cooperation to vaccine distribution. I mean, we're talking about people's lives here. And I think we've all come to realize that there's no such thing as a pandemic in one country. If it's out of control in any country, it's a threat to all of us. And as we see the rapidity of, of variants uh, uh, you know, evolving in, in Brazil, I mean, my sense is that we've got a very serious public health team in place now in the United States. And even if US-Brazil cooperation on climate change does not materialize, I think that once the United States gets itself into a better place on the vaccine front, it's going to exert global leadership on the pandemic with all countries to the extent that it has capacity to do so. Because again, when it's out of control in any country, it's a threat to the United States. So I do think that there's potential for cooperation on the vaccine, but I have a suspicion that that's gonna happen on some level, no matter what, because as a global community, we need to get this thing under control, no matter what the status is of a given bilateral relationship. Thank you. Okay, very good, Nick. Uh, so let's now turn to Sueli Araujo, please, Sueli. Here. Yeah. It's an honor to participate in this debate today. Uh, the initial presentation was excellent, Nick. Um, my question is that uh, with the Bolsonaro government's approach to, the, to environment and climate, uh, which includes um, denial in, this, in relation to climate policy by important government officials, uh, includes uh, increased rates of deforest deforestation and other big problems. Is it really possible to materialize uh, the potential aid proposed by Biden administration? How to make agreements that include effective and relevant conditions in these perspectives? Go little by little, sign sectorial, uh, punctual agreements. How can we ensure that this money is somehow able to redirect uh, Brazil's anti-public policy on this issue in the that is currently uh, being implemented? In, in your opinion, are there uh, really paths in this uh, sense? Which paths? Well, Sue Ali, I uh, thank you for the for the kind words and. Uh... Uh, you have asked, I think, the question. So you're, you're not making my job easy. Uh, I appreciate it, though. I think you're focused on what we all need to focus on. Um, so thank you for the question, just first and foremost. That, I believe, the question that Sueli uh, has posed to me and the group, uh, I think that is the focus of the carry Salis Araujo negotiation. I think that's at the heart of it, right? So from the American perspective, it's a bit bizarre. I mean, we understand the politics, but if you're just looking at the substance, it's a little bizarre. It's a little strange that Minister Salis and, and others have talked about, we need more money after they kicked out, right? Noruega, right? Like the Norway fund and, and everything. You're like, well, you, and they say they didn't like the conditions, they didn't like the strings, so to speak, um, and that they infringed on Brazil's sovereignty. So what I think is that this negotiation will 
revolve around the Kerry team prodding Silas and others to say what they will do with the money. And in response, the Kerry team will come up with a series of metrics to make sure that the money is being spent in that way. Now, I suspect it's highly possible that once those conditions are laid out by Kerry and his team, that Silas and others walk away just like they walked away from, from Norway. I'm not predicting success. Uh, you know, it's impossible to, to do that. I, what I'm trying to do is outline what I think is the most likely approach from the US and why. Um, and so what I will say generally is that whether it's through the United States Agency for International Development, USAID, um, and up, you know, the Inter-American Foundation, you now have the, the DFC, we have a lot of development agencies in the United States. And we put money, we, we fund programs throughout the world in a lot of difficult places, whether it's in a, you know, a war zone or whether it's with a sort of less than friendly government. And we have a lot of practices that are put into place to track the money that, that we give. So I don't think it's impossible for the United States to enter into agreement with Brazil. I'm making this up. $2 billion, right? I'm just, as an example, to uh, work on uh, reducing deforestation and investing in uh, sustainable forest development, right? And uh, track that money. And if it's not being spent appropriately, pulling it. I mean, that, that, that has happened. I think that's within the capacity of the United States uh, government to do and and it's and it's sort of a standard piece of how we we give uh development aid out now of course there have been instances of corruption of you know desvios nothing is is perfect but this is generally something that the united states government factors in when it when it looks at at development assistance and providing technical expertise uh but again i think because of how polarizing bolsonaro is in washington dc especially among democrats um, also because there is not a, a um, black and white kind of Cold War vision of US, Brazil, China, if Minister Salles and Minister Araujo simply cannot accept the conditions that Kerry and his team lay out for how assistance would work, then I think we won't get to an agreement and we'll, we'll see a very tense time in the relationship. Thank you. Very good. Um, Maria Herminia, please, your yes, words. Good morning. Uh, thank you for your very interesting presentation. It's really great to be here and with the Russo Center. The, the Russo Center has, I, I've, I have been linked to the Russo Center for so long that uh, 13,000 Pennsylvania Avenue is a kind of home for me in, 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 in Washington. And so I'm very happy to, with this uh, collaboration. And I hope we follow up with, with other, uh, other initiatives. I, I would like to, to come back a little to the issue of uh, civil society, private sector, uh, because I think the, 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 the great, the great transformation in Brazil in the last period is that uh, a change in the public opinion regarding the, the environmental issues and also the change on the importance of uh, some uh, societal actors in, in this discussion, especially uh, private sector. I know that this, what we are discussing here, implies in, in negotiations between governments. But my, my question is uh, how far uh, can we go and in what directions can we go without the government in order to, uh, to press Press, uh, press those people to change their, their behavior. I'm not uh, optimistic regarding this, but I think how, how far we can go 
in private private uh, corporate cooperation in scientific cooperation and so on in order to create uh, constraints uh, to to the governmental policies regarding uh, this issue because i think that by themselves, they will continue to do what they are doing. That's it. <clears throat> uh, well, well th I thank you for uh, uh, the, the question. And uh, I have similarly warm feelings about, about the Wilson Center. So I hope in the not too distant future to, to, to see you there one day when we can all uh, hopefully travel uh, again. Um, on the question of, of scientific cooperation, I would just say that Brazil and the United States have a very long history there. And I fully expect that type of cooperation, irrespective of the politics, um, to continue. I mean, whether it's from the, you know, the National Institute of Health and Fio Cruz or you know, whatever it is, Brazilian and, and US scientists have collaborated and cooperated uh, for, for decades. Uh, somewhat irrespective of uh, where the the you know heads of state right the kind of macro political moment stands at at any given time. So I do think that that's a promising um, area to at a minimum sort of maintain a floor to the relationship so that <clears throat> no matter what happens, certain actors in Brazilian and, and US societies continue to talk to each other. And I think that will be one of the areas where it's most likely. I also think the need as an as a international community to get the COVID-19 pandemic under control lends itself to that. Um, and the situation, I'm not an epidemiologist, but the, you know, the situation in, in Brazil just seems so worrisome and with implications really around the, the world, given how the virus is evolving, that um, I just have to imagine that this will be on the agenda, no matter what the politics are between the two presidents. Um, on the question of civil society and the private sector uh, pressuring the, the Bolsonaro government or, or putting constraints, guardrails is sometimes what we say here. Um, you know, Maria, I, I might turn the question back to, to you. I mean, I feel like this group would have a better sense of how effective civil society, Br Brazilian civil society and the Brazilian private sector can be in influencing uh, the government. I mean, I think you all are better positioned to, to answer that question than, than I am. Um, you know, when I was mapping out, should the discussions between the two governments go poorly? I was mentioning some theoretical policy options that the United States government could adopt if things go badly. And at that point, I think that that would put a fair amount of pressure and incentive into the Brazilian private sector to pressure the government to, to change because we're talking about potentially uh, restricting trade opportunities, right? Including in some sectors that have traditionally been allies of Bolsonaro. I think the question is, are those actors perceiving right now how important this issue is in Washington? And are they proactively whispering in the ear of the Brazilian government that a compromise you know, needs, to be, needs to be found? I just don't know the answer to uh, that question. But on the surface, I would think that both the Brazilian private sector and frankly, other, uh, the Brazilian military, if they could be induced to speak to some of the strategic implications of not pursuing climate change cooperation with the United States, that would be helpful. Their capacity and willingness to do so, I think others here today are, are better equipped to speak to than myself. Very good. Private sector, the military. Eduardo Marçon, up to you. <laughs> thanks, thanks a lot, Alberto. Uh, well, uh, my question was actually related to the, uh, to the private sector diplomacy. So <laughs> it, I, I think it was pretty much answered. 
uh, by you, Nick. Thanks a lot for, for your presentation. Uh, as Alberto said, I come from the private sector. I spent more, uh, almost 30 years in the aerospace and defense uh, sector. That's why he's hitting me on the military and, <laughs> and private sector. So, um, but, uh, but now I'm pretty much involved in, uh, uh, in developing some uh, uh, green, green financing solutions in, here in Brazil. But again, I would like to explore a little bit further. The, the private sector dipl diplomacy, uh, let's say, because we can forget about our traditional diplomacy, uh, which is fading away, unfortunately, uh, against the traditions of Itamaraty. Uh, I, 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 in my previous capacities, I used to have, I used to participate in US-Brazil dialogue on defense uh, industry, which was very effective. Uh, the, the, let's say the, the government creating uh, the background, uh, but the private sector acting as, let's say, in, in, uh, as the policy makers, uh, building, building, uh, building the links and building uh, background for cooperation and this kind of thing in a sector which is very, very difficult. Uh, defense is not, uh, it's not something that you can discuss uh, in every corner. Anyway, uh, I, would I would say that perhaps uh, this uh, experience between Brazil and US in the defense market could be uh, useful right here. Uh, a kind of dialogue where the private sector might play this, uh, this um, uh, major role, especially because the private sector will be the one affected uh, uh, primarily by any sanctions or any uh, limitations coming from uh, retaliation coming from uh, from the U.S. government in our productions or exports. Uh, uh, so I, I perhaps this is this is one of the examples that we can we can uh, use uh, for let's say to to pave the way further uh, between the two countries in uh, the themes uh, related to environment. Eduardo, thank you for your comments. And uh, again, for what it's worth, I, I, I really couldn't agree more. I, I spent some time working on the US-Brazil defense relationship and a number of years actually um, uh, in, the, in the earlier years of my, of my government tenure. And um, one of the reasons why I think what you're highlighting is so important is that the US-Brazil defense relationship has strengthened uh, irrespective of party on both sides for well over 20 years. Uh, it got closer under Lula. Um, it got closer under Gilma. It continued to get closer under Temer and, and it's gotten closer under Bolsonaro. And for example, uh, not to be a broken record, but the 2015 visit between Obama and Rousseff, um, it was done in conjunction with Brazil ratifying um, through the Brazilian Congress, a series of fundamental foundational defense cooperation agreements. One, literally the US-Brazil defense cooperation agreement, but another was the US-Brazil general security of military information agreement. I dare you to try to say that six times fast, but what we call uh, the Gisomia agreement, which allow, it creates procedures for the Brazilian military and the US military to share classified information, which is a prerequisite um, for a lot of defense cooperation because classified information also means classified sensitive technology. So frequently you can't integrate certain systems if you don't have that agreement in place. Um, and obviously that's only continued in the Trump uh, and Bolsonaro era. So all of which is to say is there's a really strong infrastructure in place for that relationship to continue to flourish. It obviously has huge uh, commercial uh, implications on, on both sides, right? Um, uh, and I also just think that given the, I, I, I know it's complex and nuanced, but, but given the, the perch, the, the space that the Brazilian military occupies, not only in terms of all of the uh, senior advisors that are military or former military to the Brazilian president, but also culturally, there's just this sense that that is a milieu and environment in which President Bolsonaro is comfortable, that from a US perspective, engaging with the Brazilian military to understand their perspectives 
uh, and try to develop uh, new forms of cooperation in terms of sustainability could really yield a lot of benefits um, and also help, if it goes well, move the entire discussion away from some of the older tensions surrounding sovereignty, which in no small measure have been concerns of the Brazilian military establishment. Um, so I think that that's a really necessary avenue for the Biden administration to pursue as it tries to create a productive relationship with the Bolsonaro team. With respect to the private sector, I don't have a tremendous amount more to add uh, than, I, than I did in my prior comment in no small measure, uh, um, because I, I agree with much of what you laid out, uh, Eduardo. The one thing I would say is that, that I didn't mention is in the Obama administration, there was a concerted effort to create a series of strategic dialogues precisely so that um, the US government in particular uh, could start hearing from more Brazilian voices and interlocutors. You know, I think like in the 80s and 90s, so much of the engagement was State Department Itamarachi, you know? Um, and so under, there was a, a strategic defense dialogue that was created. There was a strategic energy dialogue that was created. And the idea there was that, you know, Ernie Moniz, our secretary of energy at the time and, and, and Minister Teixeira, they would have their own dialogue. And the Minister of Defense and, you know, Ash Carter would have their own dialogue. And we'd have a, a, a global strategic dialogue run by John Kerry, um, and, and the Chancelier, right? And so that you would diversify. And one of those initiatives, and Eduardo, I bet you're familiar with it, um, was the US-Brazil CEO Forum, which was supposed to bring leading US executives and leading Brazilian executives who each have operations and interests in the other country together for an annual dialogue that would then present recommendations for how to further uh, business ties and trade relations to the two heads of state. Um, that is the type of mechanism that I think needs to come back uh, and, and be strengthened um, because it creates an institutionalized mechanism by which, with, so from the Brazilian perspective, it creates an institutional mechanism by which Brazilian CEOs have the, the cover, the support, so to speak, of US CEOs to go to Bolsonaro and say, here are some recommendations. These are things that we need to be successful. Please work with the United States to effectuate them. And by the way, to make some of this happen, we need to be more proactive in the climate space. So that is something, Eduardo, to your point, where I'm just using one example. I'm sure there are others, right? But these are the types of, of, of initiatives and, and mechanisms that I think um, the United States needs to, to push for from the government perspective and Brazilian civil society and the private sector also needs to be supportive of because it can help create that additional context and maybe uh, in some instances constraints that could get us to a better place. Okay, very good. So uh, Anya, I think we have some questions from our audience on Facebook. And then I will turn to Jacques Markovic for a further comment on one specific issue. Uh, then I don't know if Professor Plonsky will want to use the word to make some comment or just a salute. It's up to Professor Plonsky, the director of USP's Tugboat, the, the, the Institute of Advanced Studies. And then I think uh, Paulo Sotero would make his final remarks. Okay, and then we wrap this up. So Anya, what are the questions that uh, the audience kindly laid out for us? Thank you, Alberto. And thank you again, Nick. Um, this has been excellent. And on behalf of the Wilson Center's Brazil Institute, we're so pleased to host this conversation um, with all of you. So we have gotten a couple questions from our audience on Facebook. Um, and I want in particular to highlight two of them which both deal with domestic politics. One is domestic politics in Brazil, and one is domestic politics in the US and their impact on um, the sustainability conversation between our two countries. Um, so first for Brazil, how is the 2022 election 
Um, you know, we saw the news about former President Luis Inacio Lula da Silva earlier this week, and obviously, you know, President Bolsonaro is going to be running for re-election. So how could these dynamics impact Bolsonaro's relationship with the U.S., um, as well as his sustainability actions? And then the second question on the U.S. side is what is going to be the role of the more progressive parts of the Democratic Party here in the U.S., when it comes to Biden's relationship with Brazil, um, and in particular, his stance on climate policy. Thank you, Anya. Um, well, those are both challenging questions. So um, uh, let, me, let, me, let me start with Brazil, although again, I feel perhaps given the group that's, that's here, the, the least equipped to answer these questions, I've, I've, I've learned to be hesitant to interpret Brazilian domestic politics when I'm speaking with a group of, of Brazilians, but I'll, I'll give it my best shot. Uh, but just I do want to put out the, the, the humble uh, caveat there. Um, so my sense is, is you know, one, uh, the news surrounding um, uh, former President Lula, I think, you know, the most obvious implication is that the 2022 election has now started. Um, and it's probably, uh, you know, that's a little bit sooner than may maybe many of us anticipated, but I, I think it's safe to say we're in political season now um, in Brazil. Not that that ever goes away, but it can intensify and, and, and de-intensify. So I think that's the, I mean, that's the first clear uh, implication. From where I sit, it, it also means that um, I'm not sure that it was going to go in a different direction anyway, but the environment, the zeitgeist, so to speak, of political polarization in Brazil is not going to diminish. It's probably only going to intensify further. We've now, we now seem to have the two archetypes of the Brazilian political divide, presumably, uh, um, you know, running for office. And I think as, you know, we saw in, in the United States, uh, all of the all of that polarization, it's always there, but it can become a little bit more latent when there isn't an election to direct it to. And now, in some ways, the battle lines have been drawn, and and I anticipate that uh, ramping up. I suspect that that means, in in general, whether it's on COVID politics and Bolsonaro's controversial posture there, the environment, human rights, that all of that just becomes more magnified, right? Because each side has the perfect foil to create the contrast, right? And so I wonder slash worry that uh, Lula's, I'm not even quite sure what to call it, but let's say reemergence for lack of a better word, um, it, 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 it entrenches Bolsonaro, it, it further, it, it, it has him further consolidate his positions. And if he associates climate change with this, you know, kind of radical leftist, non-market friendly uh, agenda, it could certainly limit opportunities for climate change cooperation. I'm not predicting that, but it certainly seems possible. Um, it will be counterbalanced with an ongoing message from the United States that climate change is important. And another part of Bolsonaro's brand, of course, is that uh, he would approximate Brazil to the, to the United States. So I don't think it's clear cut, but I think it's a possibility. Um, and from a US perspective, I think the news of Lula's um, you know, judicial status and, and potential candidacy for president changes almost nothing, frankly. Uh, because this team and the Democratic Party writ large does not operate like Bolsonaro does. We engage with states. We do not engage with political parties. And so the Biden team is not going to make the mistake that I think, frankly, the Bolsonaro team did make by so closely aligning itself with the Trump administration, right? And becoming so overtly political, even to campaign for Trump, that's not going to happen uh, under, under Biden. And so, um, it's, on, it's a decision for the Brazilian people to make about who their next leader is. And for the next nearly two years, I guess it's more like 20 months, 
Um, the U.S. government is charged with working with Brazil's duly elected leader, and that is Jair Bolsonaro. And our priorities on climate change and otherwise do not change because a very prominent national politician in Brazil might now be more likely to become president. Uh, we will continue to just do what we do. Um, and so I don't think that from a US perspective, it changes, for example, the consultations that Kerry and his team are having uh, with the Brazilians at all. Um, in terms of US domestic politics, um, well, I think you know the proof is in the pudding a little bit, right? Uh, before January 20th, uh, how Biden would administer relations with Brazil, given the controversial reputation and, and polemic reputation that Bolsonaro has in Washington was a bit of an open question. We are now two months in. And essentially, I think they've interpreted, or not interpreted, they've digested where the progressive wing of the party is and its approach is its approach, uh, just not, which is really where I started uh, my remarks. They are giving engagement a shot but there is not a lot of trust. There's a fair amount of skepticism. And if they can induce cooperation, they're going to engage with it in good faith. And if they feel like the commitment is not forthcoming, then they will pivot and shift an approach. And I think it will be to the detriment of US-Brazil relations writ large. I think that approach was adopted, factoring in the diverse views of the Bolsonaro government within the Democratic Party. Um, so that's really my answer. But I do, just as a tangent, want to say that um, to whoever asked the question and to others, I would not frame this um, exclusively in when it comes to the Democratic Party in terms of the progressive wing and the, you know, the moderate or centrist wing. Um, you know, I'll just note that um, one of the most influential senators in the Democratic Party in the United States is a senator from New Jersey, the state of New Jersey. His name is Bob Menendez, um, he's, he's Cuban American. He's a, by all uh, definitions, he's a moderate uh, centrist uh, Democrat. He also now is the chair, the head of our Senate Foreign Relations Committee. So he's a very influential voice on foreign policy matters. He recently uh, sent a letter to President Bolsonaro expressing deep concern um, and, and upset with some of the comments that the Bolsonaro administration made with respect to the legitimacy of the US presidential election in November, and with respect to the events on January 6th, when a group of domestic terrorists invaded our Capitol building and five people died. Um, and I just highlight this to say that this is not so cleanly a progressive, moderate split in the Democratic Party. There is a broader concern about some of the actions and rhetoric uh, from the Brazilian administration in the party writ large. Um, and so how that ultimately plays out in the Biden administration's approach, um, it's more multifaceted, right? The tensions are not just left, right, right? Um, um, this is about trying to fundamentally reorient um, how the two countries engage, talk about each other, and respect each other's respective democracies. Very good, very good, Nick. Uh, Jacques, uh, I think you had some comments about one well, specific point. One comment that has to do with the private sector, because uh, some of my colleagues very well brought this issue uh, on the table, Nick. And it's a very important one. And I think that we should underline what is happening in terms of financial flows globally and in Brazil. I mean, uh, the International Bank of Settlements already have since uh, five years ago, already a whole uh, set of rules regarding financial flows and sustainability. And the Central Bank of Brazil just uh, a year ago created a new directorship with a very solid and robust leadership that already uh, informed most of uh, the economic actors that uh, by 2022, uh, the rules regarding the internal flows in Brazil will be submitted to the same practices. 
And as my colleagues know, we had one of the CEOs of uh, one of the three major banks in Brazil last year uh, that came to bring his, uh, uh, it was a rhetoric, but at the same time, the large Brazilian banks, they know already that uh, they will have to join this international community. I mean, the message that I want to bring to you, since you are quite a very highly, highly sophisticated observer regarding Brazil, is that there are some uh, state initiative, and you said it, we are talking about relation among uh, national states, and the central bank is one of them, and he is taking a very, very uh, robust initiative to comply with the international rules being applied, and this will condition the private sector. Now, clearly, the private sector is as pressured as many others in the US, in Europe, even in Asia regarding the sanitary crisis. So if you talk to the CEOs, they are worried with other topics, but their finance people, they know that they have to adjust and they will have to adapt. So it's just a footnote uh, for your uh, information. Thank you. Jacques, I appreciate it. You know, I, I must confess, I was not fully, uh, it's a great point. I, I was not fully aware of all of that context. It makes sense uh, to me, but anyway, I, 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 I appreciate the the footnote. So, Enya, any remaining comments or questions from our distinguished audience? Um, we do have um, one more question, um, and it has to do with the Brazilian Congress and their role um, in, you know, potential bilateral relationships on sustainability. So Congress to Congress engagement, as well as within Brazil. Um, and Nick, if you want to pass on this or turn it over to someone else, um, you know, how the Brazilian Congress might influence President Bolsonaro's policy, especially in terms of deforestation and, and kind of creating a standing forest economy. Uh, I, the latter question, I would love to hear from, from others on. I think they are better um, prepared than, than I to talk about how the legislature uh, might be an important interlocutor on, on climate matters. But I do just want to say one thing, um, which is that myself, as an observer of, of, of Brazil and, and Brazilian politics here in the United States uh, and others, have noted um, over the last several years how much more of a protagonist the Brazilian Congress has become just writ large, uh, putting aside climate change, whether we're talking about uh, you know, Maya's leadership over the last couple of years or in, in other instances, I do think there's a sense that it's, it's become more of a player. I mean, it was always important, but, but it's, it's developed a bit more independence, especially from where I sat, I remember 10 years ago or so on foreign policy matters, there wasn't this sense that the Brazilian Congress uh, was a major actor in that space. And I just think more generally that that's changing. Um, perhaps this is because I've got like, you know, my US context and hat on, but I, I generally think, and so come from this sort of checks and balances type of context, I, I generally think that that's a, a positive development in, from an institutionality and, and governance sort of democracy standpoint for Brazil, much like, um, many thought in the earlier days anyway of, of Lava Jato that, that some of what we were seeing from the Brazilian judiciary was also kind of a, a, a movement um, in the kind of further ripening and evolution of, of Brazilian democracy. I think it is vital that uh, the US Congress and the Brazilian Congress talk more. We've talked a lot about the private sector um, and civil society, but I also think that um, whether we're talking about appropriations committees to talk about budgeting processes or the traditional kind of foreign affairs committees, um, we need to build up these mechanisms of dialogue. Uh, it will, at a minimum, it provides, I think, a more nuanced understanding between legislators, which is always important. Um, but I also just think at this time when both countries have gone through such polarization, uh, and, and, and everything just feels like such a polemic, it's important for Brazilian legislators to understand that notwithstanding the polarization and the rhetoric, there's a multitude of views in the United States about foreign policy, Brazil, 
US-Brazil relations and Brazil's role in the world. And similarly, I think it's really important for Brazilian legislators to understand the diversity of opinions within our Congress, whether that's a Bob Menendez or an Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, whatever it might be, there's really a diverse spectrum of political ideology these days uh, in the Congress. And I think Brazil, the Brazilian political establishment and Brazil as a country as a whole would only stand to benefit from having more opportunities to grasp those those nuances. Um, it's something that uh, whenever I'm, I'm called upon, I've certainly tried to you know, facilitate introductions because I do think that legislative dialogue is a promising avenue for future cooperation. And it's one that's relatively underdeveloped. Thank you so much, Nick. We are in our final stretch here. I don't know if Paulo Sotero could make his uh, wrapping up comments and perhaps address uh, assess this question that was posed about the legislative branch. And uh, then we will turn to, to Nick for his uh, final last comments, words uh, for today, of course. And then to Professor Plonsky to formally end this up. Okay, okay, Anya, any mistake I made in terms of the, the protocol here? No, this is excellent. I just wanna say again, we've been so pleased to co-host this with you. Um, and with all the members of uh, Gassinch today. Likewise, likewise, and it was a great pleasure and a success. I saw that we had more than 60 people following us on Facebook and more than 20 people here on the Zoom room. And some people were in and out. So uh, I think we had more than 90 uh, different individuals following this. And uh, certainly we have more people watch it on YouTube. It was, it will be available on YouTube. And uh, uh, hope, looking forward for the next chapter, Paulo, Anya, Nick, between Gacint and um, the Brazil Institute, the Woodrow Wilson Center. So Paulo, would you like to make some final well, comments? Well, just briefly to thank you very much, Alberto, uh, for uh, us having this collaboration, obviously to thank Nick, uh, enormously for his wonderful presentation. This is precisely the type of engagement that we had in mind at, when we uh, started the Brazil Institute. There was a Brazil project before, but in 2006, we started as an institute. Uh, and uh, here it is. Uh, we are going to have to work very, very hard to keep this dialogue going. Uh, there is, I, I think the news in, from Brazil is still very, very worrisome. Uh, maybe we are going to be to more phase of polarization, a deeper polarization, which doesn't help the country. Uh, but in the United States, well, let me end on a positive note. In the United States, we have good news to share in just a matter of uh, what a couple of well, hours maybe uh, the uh, Biden Harris uh, stimulus package will be law in the United States will be approved uh, in the House of Representatives in the Senate the process will be completed this is an enormous piece of legislation uh, uh, this will advance social policy by some estimates, it will cut, it will cut uh, uh, children's poverty in the United States by half, one act. Okay, so I think that you have, this is just, the government is not yet two months old. Uh, I think there is enormous motivation here. And uh, it is, I think, important to highlight this in Brazil. And the other thing is what, uh, there, there was a statement about what Nick uh, highlighted, uh, the recent uh, statement by uh, Senator Menendez uh, on uh, some very unfortunate, and I would say even stupid statements by both the president, Bolsonaro, and his foreign minister, uh, uh, putting in doubt the legitimacy of Biden's election. This is something that uh, you should, in Brazil, really uh, uh, treat with a poet, poeti, 
This is something there is no room for this type of nonsense. And this could be very, very damaging because although there is all this goodwill and that it has always been here vis-a-vis -vis Brazil, Brazil has managed, unfortunately, to get itself uh, sort of out of the, off the debate a bit. Uh, there is ample space to work together and to continue, but I think we have to be uh, much more attentive to those details that we have been uh, so far. Uh, there is an enormous opportunity. This dialogue on the environment and Anya and I and the Brazil Institute, I see Daniela Chiaretti here in the group that has been an enormous resource, uh, has informed all of us about this, uh, this challenge uh, and this dialogue between uh, Brazil and the United States to the through the, the Concertação pela Amazonia and the Brazil Institute. All of this is very promising, but it requires constant work. Uh, and uh, I think this, this conversation was uh, part of that. I hope that we can continue. Uh, I wanted to thank Alberto very much uh, and uh, all of you, uh, Professor Maria Herminia, who has been with us at from the beginning uh, and uh, thank you very much it's a sunny day here it's a sunny day here as well paulo so at least uh, weather like uh, we are doing great um so uh nick do you want to make any final remarks or salutes well, uh, thank you, Alberto. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty much talked out uh, at, at this point, but I, I did just, uh, again, want to thank you, Alberto, for uh, the opportunity to engage with, with, with Kassim and, and to Paolo again for the very kind introduction and, and Anya and all the support um, from the Brazil uh, Institute and, and Wilson Center over the years. Just my concluding thought and very much sort of echoing what, what Paolo just said is obviously we all need to uh, be eyes wide open, uh, the challenges are, are very real, but uh, I, I would just encourage everyone to not give in to, to cynicism. Um, we all need to roll up our sleeves and work. Uh, we have been through hard times, many in the past, in the diplomatic relationship, and we have by and large uh, found our way through. At the end of the day, uh, I'm confident um, I'm not sure on what timeline, but we'll, we'll, we'll see our way through uh, again, but it's incumbent upon all the people who have participated in this conversation and, and others to be committed to that uh, objective and, uh, and, and do the work. Thanks again uh, for having me. It was really just such a pleasure uh, and an honor. Well, uh, we thank you, Nick, for such a, <clears throat> an engaging uh, speech. Um, well, you noticed how uh, uh, you developed this, this conversation. And um, I think we had a great morning. Great morning. Thank you, Anya. Thank you, Paulo. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, everybody in this room. Thank you, everybody on Facebook. Professor Plonsky, please uh, do the honors and uh, end this in the proper manner. OK, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, dear Roberto, thank you very much for first uh, organizing uh, one more excellent high level and uh, fruitful uh, Gassint meeting and the second for opening this uh, one and a half minute spot for uh, your good friend. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be uh, in the room with uh, dear colleagues from USP, Professor Maria Herminia, Professor Jacques Markovic, Professor Eduardo Viola, who's now at the Institute for Advanced Study. Uh, and, and other colleagues and Paulo Sotero, it's a pleasure to hear you again. Uh, uh, the Woodrow Institute is very respected and uh, uh, I think we can do much more than has been done. A lot has been done, but we can do much more. Uh, Anya, thank you for being such a, a very effective and, and, uh, and nice host for this meeting. Uh, uh, Nick, uh, I, I learned a lot. Uh, uh, I learned a lot from you uh, about, um, uh, I would say about not only strategy, but also, as you said, about uh, uh, the devils that are, that isn't the details 
uh, uh, what goes uh, around Potter's room uh, and what happens uh, in, in the planes when they travel, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it was very interesting because you you, you merge in a, such a smoothness uh, way both. Uh, 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 Top thinking and and uh, and on the ground practice. I, I just uh, uh, I have I, I was wondering during uh, this, this uh, conversation and uh, on, on basically one question and it's not really uh, a question in the strict sense. I mean it's maybe it's a wishful question uh, which has to do with uh, looking a little bit farther than. Uh, 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 this year, the elections, uh, but uh, and but taking uh, what Professor Viola asked and your answer about pandemics, not about uh, maybe that if uh, uh, Biden's go Biden government uh, shares uh, uh, some containers of vaccines, things will be very good for Brazil, but also uh, will smoothen relations. Uh, but I, I would look uh, forward because uh, the connection between uh, uh, the environmental issues and human health has been recognized for a long time, but being recognized uh, is one thing and uh, being really a driver for uh, the practice, for investment, for rules, for international relations uh, is another thing. And uh, this pandemics or syndemics as some uh, call, I think uh, is opening more minds and hearts to the connection between the enormous risks that we have of uh, facing new uh, big troubles and uh, uh, what we do with our uh, with the environment, to make it in a very short term. Uh, and uh, health is a common denominator. I think uh, 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 not getting into details of uh, some specific uh, medicines or, or anti-vax or etc. But basically health is a common good, uh, also a common mental good. Everybody wishes health. Uh, so my, 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 again, it's a wishful question is if uh, uh, we don't have only the, the uh, let's say the contrast between, or the discussion between uh, environment and, and economics, but if we put a third element, which is health in this equation, if this uh, maybe could, uh, from a systemic point of view, uh, 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 enlarge the space of dialogue uh, between obviously US and Brazil that we are talking here, but also in general of dealing which, uh, with, with such uh, uh, issues and not reducing it to, to, to environment, economics and, uh, and what's around. So, uh, as I told you, it's not a, a real question, it's, it's a wishful question. So, I wish it will happen. Yeah. And Alberto, uh, I, I, so again, thank you so much. And uh, if I have the right, oh, Professor Janina, sorry, forgot to mention her. We, we have so many things in common with Institute of International Relations. Uh, I heard her presentation at the beginning. Uh, uh, I, I, if I have the right to, to the last word, I would wish uh, uh, a good lunch for all of us uh, here. And uh, thank you again so much to, to Nick, to Paulo, to Anya, Alberto, and to whoever made all the uh, uh, wonderful questions. And, uh, and obviously also Professor Sueli, uh, who has a, enormous practice uh, from her position at IBOMA. And uh, Good afternoon.